How have you guys been doing? If you uh, been working on anything interesting, let me sit down for a second. I'm about four songs into the metal album. Really? How many songs is it going to be? Uh, I've got a notebook list of like all my metal songs that I've ever written, but never like produced. And it's like 2025. 20, so I wow. don't think it's going to be all of those. I'll try to produce as many as I can and then take the best ones, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. How are you doing like the instruments? Uh, real drummer, program drums? The ones I've got so far are program drums because I was already working on them. Uh, but yeah. moving forward, I want to try to use this drum kit I've got because I've been learning to play drums. Nice. So that the drum sounds are more natural because I tend to program drums that you couldn't actually play, like <laughs> kind of sort of, but there's like lots of extra layers and hits in there. That, yeah. And so I want to try to make it a little drum. bit more simple and straight up rock and roll feel. Yeah, cool. Well, metal drumming is definitely difficult and challenging, you know, the speed and tense. I'm be... definitely not going to do any like modern speed metal type drumming. I, I can't do like kick drum like that or anything. Yeah. <laughs> you could program in those hits though. <laughs> yeah, if I need to here and there. Are you recording the guitars through amps? Or are you doing something different? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I cool. you got a like uh, last year, I guess it was. I finally got a tone that i was pretty happy with like a distorted crunch tone like yeah. a little on the heavier side of crunch and i'm combining like a solid state bass amp with a smaller uh tube amp and the tube amp pr pr provides like a upper mid sort of like bite and then that solid state amp provides all the like low end and the chunk that i need and so right. using the bass amp for guitar is kind of an unusual thing and it wouldn't work by itself but combining with the little tube amp and then like miking it the right way yeah and then also supplementing that with the direct signal either that or like reamping that the actual mic signal too into extra layers of like some bsc plugins that are like more modern metal style and then combining all that i've gotten a pretty sweet tone that i'm kind of using on all the songs oh, that's awesome i've been doing like a combination you know uh i've recorded through amps um and done some uh you know direct amplitude stuff layer it together to get some different tones that i can't really get at home uh, i was going through like a fender deluxe it's got 112 it's tube amp 112 and also uh my buddy's roland uh what do you call it the jazz chorus nice uh, yeah that thing's pretty cool I've, I've come to appreciate that amp a lot but uh yeah like I was miking both amps and then had a room mic also. Um, sometimes it worked, but sometimes it felt like it was just too much information. I was better. You off. really got to watch for the phase. Yeah. So what I've been doing is I've been making sure I calculated that five inches is like a good because that's like enough length for the low E waveform or like low D, low C, something like that to have like one full waveform cycle before it hits right. the mic, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but so I'm making sure every mic is like a five inch interval from each source so right. <laughs> the room mics are each five inch five inch interval from both the different amps you know when one might be 25 inches one might be 30 but i'm making sure everything is that five inch interval as closely as possible and that pretty much has been avoiding phase issues nice you got like the tape measure out and everything that's cool i didn't i didn't go to that trouble i just moved them till they sounded like they worked well together well yeah you always got to listen to it too that's that's yeah. definitely essential i think uh i i just the last few tracks i've been recording have just been one mic on one amp I'm just it's working it's a together. good solid way to do it no worries about phase issues yeah. at all yeah as these like sessions get bigger and bigger it's nice not to have lots of tracks for every single instrument <laughs> oh yeah for sure another thing i'm doing is i'm uh combining all those mic the four mics that i'm using two room mics and then one direct on each amp all into a mixer mm. and then that goes into ableton so the ableton is okay. just stereo so i don't have four tracks to deal with only two which kind of helps a bit as long as i make sure the face is good going into the mixer yeah okay that's cool so you just get the stereo out nice yup yup and then i can send a, an external send to that to extra effects like hardware reverb or whatever if i want mm. cool well, that's fun, man. I'm excited to hear what you come up with, you know? Yeah, yeah. Likewise with you and your project. Yeah, cool. 
Anyone else got anything fun? Tom, you look like you unmuted yeah. yourself. There. Actually, a buddy of mine is not a bad singer, and we're putting together an acoustic set, acoustic guitar. Awesome. And uh, so I'm excited to learn about recording vocals. We're both, yeah. We both use Ableton, but, you know, there's lots to learn about how to do vocals well. Yeah, I mean, I'm learning too as I do it, you know, figuring new stuff out, stuff that works. Um, since we have 10 songs that are already recorded, I'm trying to figure out like a process. And I think I got something. I've recorded half the vocals, so half five of the 10 songs. And in listening back in the car and, you know, just like making sure like things are good, I, I'm, I have a couple notes of like things I do want to fix, but all in all, I'm like, I'm pretty happy with it. You know, there's, I think like with vocals, like one of the hardest things is like your own head, really, you know, um, the confidence issue. Like I, I'm not a trained singer. I'm not, I don't even know if I would say I'm a singer to anybody, <laughs> but I sing. Uh, <laughs> and just that, you know, because like, especially when you're recording it yourself, you're listening from like the perspective of like the person that wants to make sure everything sounds good everything's like recorded well in tune the performances are there but then you're also trying to be the singer where you sort of have to like just go for it and let loose a little um so i i find it's like those two opposite mindsets almost like working against each other or with each other right or maybe i don't know but sometimes you know that's definitely the hardest part for me. It's just like, like that emotional thing. Cause you have to sort of like be emotional when you sing, but you can't be emotional when you analyze it. You got to just be like, Oh, that, that just wasn't good. We'll just do it again. We'll try another one. We'll try something different, but it's very easy for me, especially to just like start getting down on myself. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, this is silly. You know, I should, somebody that knows what they're doing should be doing this. <laughs> I've been, uh, you know, they call it vocals, not singing, but I've been doing, I've been yeah. doing backups a little bit for that same reason. It's like, I don't want my voice up front and, uh, also like layering two or three of the same thing makes right. it sound a little better, maybe, <coughs> but that's also a very specific effect, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you may not want that sound. You may yeah. want just a very clear single voice. I'd, I'd just be interested to see what you have. Yeah. yeah, I'm definitely trying to figure where that works out. Uh, you know, back in the early days of my own recording, like I pretty much doubled everything. You know, I would often just pan one left, one right, and just call it a day. And what's nice about like doubling the same exact vocal line is it sort of like fills in the gaps and strengthens it a little bit i also think it's like a little bit easier to sing when i'm singing along to one you know like you've got like the guide just keep the uh, second track <laughs> a lot of times that's what happens you know i'm following like the one i already recorded and then i'm like oh that actually sounds better because <laughs> i've got like some reference you know like pitch with your voice is weird because like on guitar it's like a fret on a piano it's a key on your voice, it's just like a smooth, you know, it's like a fretless instrument, a violin or a, anything like that. So it's hard to sometimes find it. Um, I've recorded um, like organ tracks for the vocals just to make sure I'm in tune and just follow that on my, on my headphones while I'm singing. Yeah. I very often have like my guitar, usually like an electric that's not plugged in. And I'll like play the melodies and sing them and then try to, you know, sometimes I'll even play the guitar with it as I sing. It's not coming through anything, but it's just, you know, the guide again, it's something to follow. And, and that's a, a big eye opener for me, actually, like figuring out the vocal melodies on an instrument to just understand like oh you know i'm this is a jump that i'm not making or this is a smaller jump that i'm trying to make it, it's always a little surprising to me i'm 
kind of like, wow, you know, I thought I was really stretching up to that note, but it's only like a step away from the other note here in the song. Um, so it's, it's nice. It's good to know the notes you're singing. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, one thing I'll do a lot is I'll record or uh, program in the vocal melody that I'm going to sing with some instrument, and then yeah. I can sing along to that. Or, and or, like you were saying, where you record a take and then you sing to that, I'll do that, but over and over and over again, just keeping the most recent take that I'm singing over. So then I'll get like closer and closer and closer to it being better and better. But then right. you also have to worry about retaining your emotion because the more technical you get, the easier it is to like, you're hitting the note perfectly, but then you lo you're you losing the human emotion. In yeah. That's a very hard thing, I think, to be aware of when you're recording your own voice is when is it like a good emotion and when is it just a bad note? <laughs> you know, what's the difference? Sometimes you kind of need a person to be like, no, keep that. You sound like your voice broke in the right spot or, or some of them say, no, you can't, you can't have that. <laughs> it's just wrong. So it's so psychological. And, um, if you're working with a singer too, if you're recording them, even like such a big part of it is just making them feel comfortable, making them like under letting them know, like you're confident in their, their voice that they. Uh, can do it. I can remember recording with um, an old band I was in, like, in, I guess we were probably in college. Yeah. And I was trying to sing a track and like, I was very nervous and uncomfortable and scared to sing in front of the whole band, like where they're just listening to my voice. But they, they were really good with like making me feel okay about it. And I was butchering it. Like it was bad. We never even finished it. <laughs> but it was a cool experience, like, you know, when they're helping me through it without like making me feel like just a complete idiot. So that's definitely a consideration. And it's something I guess like I'm trying to do a little bit here too, when I'm doing my own is to just kind of set the mood a little bit. You know, I got like my Christmas lights and um, the, I have big lights on for the camera right now, but those wouldn't really be on normally, but Having that, um, you know, this is the mic I've been using. I'll get into that in a few minutes, but just in a way that it's comfy. I'm today. I've I've got one of those standing desks. I love it. Like I can stand up at the desk right now, and um, that's a lot nicer for me for singing. I can st you know have good posture as I'm singing, and then I can go to the desk and it's like at a comfortable height. It's not sitting down, standing up, sitting down, standing up. Um, sounds like a small thing, but I think it's a big help. Comfort. Also, something uh, is like your body, you know, I on the days I know I'm going to sing, I, I usually go for like a jog, stretch out and uh, get right. I did a little stretching before we started this just so I would feel like awake and uh, limber. You know, it's like tuning your instrument, getting the voice ready. And sometimes there's cases, I guess, where you might almost want to not do that. Like maybe you want that like groggy sound, you wake up first thing in the morning and record or stay up real late. Sometimes that works too. But again, it's like a tough thing to know yourself how, how when it's good. So I'll show you guys what I've been doing. Um, it's, you know, it's always a work in progress. I always think of everything I do like that. If I get nothing out of this whole project, at least I'm going to learn. <laughs> so that'll help me like move forward and get things done. Um, I guess I could share my screen here. Turn you guys up. Um, I think this is already recording, just so you know. Yeah. Just so you know, folks. <laughs> Put you guys here. Okay. All right. So you guys can all see my screen, right? I should open the chat just so I have it handy. Cool. And we'll get the participants too, just in case anybody else pops in. So uh, let's see if you can hear the music. You can hear that okay?
Uh, yeah, we have can to hear it. it. Probably have to turn it down, I bet. Drop the master down. So if I talk over this, can you hear me talking still? <laughs> can you hear me talking over that? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of loud. It's still loud. We can still hear you. All right, I'm gonna bring it down even more. Negative twelve. So if I talk now, it's okay. yeah, that's good. Yeah, right, thank cool. you. Okay, and I can hear you too. <laughs> All right, so this is a track I did some vocals on it here. Uh, I don't think I showed you guys this one, um, but. Uh, starting like down here on these this purple track, vocal verse, pre-chorus, I got ending vocals. So it looks like I did, what, six different tracks, seven tracks, really? And if we look at it as a whole, we can kind of see things. Um, I'm going to close that down so I can really just see it. Um, uh, just so you see this whole session, it actually starts way back here. And we did like multiple takes of the song. Each one of these like blocks is like a take, a take. And then this is the one we settled on, this last one. A lot of times you just kind of know when you got it. And I think that that's what happened with us. We we're like, all right, that last one was the good one. Um, bring us down to the vocals. And I've got things labeled out on the tracks so of the verse. Um, you'll see like I did the verse vocals on one track on this one anyway and there's like a pre-chorus that i actually did on the same track here same thing here pre-chorus but i tend to like to do these things like by section i kind of like to have the different parts of the song on different tracks part of that is because i can focus on one part at a time and also a lot of times like there's different energies in the verse compared to the chorus and um this song was is a little more consistent throughout, which is probably why I kept things on here. But uh, that's something I do like to do. And a big thing I make use of are the take lanes. So you can kind of see the secrets to these vocal takes here. Um, so like this is one track. And we got some the first verse and the pre-chorus and the second verse and pre-chorus and then the chorus. Um, so I, what I like to do when I'm ready to record is I'll just highlight like a section of the song and I'll hit Command L and have it loop here so that it'll just play this over and over again. And I'll let you hear a little bit of it. I had a feeling that something was wrong That's up to you. Ain't no kind of magic gonna do the work for you. Can't fight the feeling. Can't fight the feeling. You can see I took like different takes of that can't fight the feeling part. But that verse turned out pretty good on that last one, I thought. Except for the very first few words. I stole those from that take. I should have seen Switches. it with my own two eyes. These two, I the ones believe that felt good. it, and now I must cry. And I'll take your share, and you walk with mine. I should just leave, but I did it one more time. Can't fight the feeling. Now on these parts, I did double the pre-chorus. Oh, no. They're much Can't lower in the mix. The chorus here is double too. We have a quiet part coming up. That's just one again now. Cause this is like meant to be like a more intimate vocal sound. Can't fight the feeling. Starts real soft. 
can't fight the feeling. You see, it gets doubled right after can't this. Can't fight the feeling. This is gonna be awesome. Can't fight the feeling. This part has three layers. the track um and uh you can see there's a lot of like uh going through it you know and like like on this course especially like i grabbed this part i thought was good the first take but then you know wasn't feeling those other ones and had to grab i mean that that's just doesn't need to be there but that's switch this to here and then this last part especially <laughs> i used a few different things <laughs> felt like the timing wasn't really great on any of them but i did have individual ones that had good timing so i, I just chopped it up like that and on the double i met since i'm doubling you can see like it's less work to get the double because you've got something to follow it just kind of works better um, so let me see there's the general thing um so yeah, I started with this one track, but I just kind of, after listening back, I just didn't really like the take, so I just did it again. I'll show you what's on these tracks. We'll start like kind of doing the setup. Maybe I should start uh, over here with the mic. Would it be better? I want you to see like uh, what I'm doing. Is it easier to see my screen if I or my my video if I come out of screen sharing? Oh, you guys are writing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yes, the S the SSL animus. I, I wound up going for it. <laughs> That's on the drums, really. I think I did feed a little bit of the vocal on one of them in there. That is one of the few compressors I've found that is truly unique. Like none of the other compressor plugins I have can can approach the sound for some reason. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I downloaded the demo. And I was like, ah, this is cool. So it's uh. It's a nice compressor. It's really like from the the listening mic, right? The uh, on that board, um, just compresses it in a cool way. Sort of an accidental thing they found in the studio, but it does nice stuff to the drums. Um, where'd you guys go? Yeah, it really brings out the sustain in a really nice way. Yeah. So let's see. Um, What's going on here? So you can see this a little bit anyway. Or you can't really hear me as well. So the mic here I'm using, I wound up using a condenser, the AKG C414. Um, I think type B maybe it is. Um, I thought I was going to use this mic because this is the mic I use for um, the podcast, like my broadcast mic. I love it and I do like singing into it, but I found uh, it was just like the condenser was just a little crispier, you know, just little, especially like on quiet stuff, um, you know, A being the two, if it was close, I would have went with this mic just to keep it simple. So I didn't have to worry as much about like room noises because this one, you know, really just gets what's right in front of it. And the condenser over here, the AKG, it picks up like, my neighbors, you know, raking the leaves. <laughs> it's, it's so sensitive. So the AB was, was pretty convincing that this mic was just a little nicer, 
but I was having problems with just like the reflections in the room. And I wound up getting one of these, uh, whoops, I don't want to move this too much. One of these like, uh, filter things. Um, these little like mini studio booths, these vocal filters. Uh, I wasn't really so sure it was going to do that much, but the way I kind of tested it before I bought it is I took a pillow and I just held a pillow behind the microphone and sang and recorded that. And even before I sang, like I just put the pillow behind the mic and in the headphones, I could just hear like all the noise go away. Just, it was pretty cool. Even just the room noise the mic was picking up and also my laptop, my laptop's not that far from it. And all of the like fan noises pretty much went away to a point where I could at least deal with it. So I wound up getting one of these things and I do really like it a lot. I got to say, and part of the thing that I wasn't expecting to like about it was that when you stand in it, you feel like you're in a little booth. It gives you that like feeling that you're, um, you know, you're in the zone a little bit. You kind of only see the microphone and the, the thing behind it, the filter, and it just it helps you just get there. Um, so I, I'm really pretty happy with it. I'm surprised how much I like it, honestly. I thought it might have been like a gimmicky thing, but it is pretty effective. And uh, so, yeah, that's going like right into my interface. Nothing, no like preamps other than whatever's in the interface. Uh, no like outboard gear or anything. And I just set up like a kind of crude channel strip, nothing, I might change this, you know, but what I really wanted was something that I can just sing through and like feel good. And that took a, a minute to set up. Um, but I started with a de-esser because that mic will pick up all those like S sounds. So I got this de-esser going on here. Um, and it, you know, it's not adjusted perfectly. I had a feeling that something... See, it's getting more than just my Fs and Ss and all that I... stuff. But um, I... it's uh, what I'm trying to do in the beginning of my chain is remove the stuff I don't want. So I definitely don't want all of those like you know pff, pff, all those sounds like anything i can get rid of with the de-esser um i want to just get out in the beginning and then with the channel strip that this is the channel strip i use on everything i'm cutting out the lows like right away i know i don't need all that rumbling low there's a lot of dr the tom drums on this song especially and bass um so we don't need the vocals to go there and just i found like this was kind of a spot in my voice that i wasn't crazy about so i just dipped it a little bit and then it goes through a compressor and then it goes through another compressor and another compressor i'm trying to just get it in like stages i don't know if any guys do that like um rather than like really slamming it on one compressor i let like each one take a little bit so it's not so drastic it is i mean i i'm compressing it a lot but um, i like to split them into chains myself so like in an audio effect rack you mean yeah okay so you've got different chains so you have another layer of control as to like how to split the two compressed signals oh. with the dry signal too yeah okay so you've got like i guess a bunch of parallel compressors but they're not yeah. not parallel compression but <laughs> okay that's cool that's something to play around with i've never really tried that on vocals um but i got this uh yeah, these compressors going. This is just to tame the levels. Again, like this whole channel strip at this point is mostly so I feel good in my headphones so that I can record and like the way the voice sounds. I did put a saturator on it with kind of a lot of drive just to give it a little more bite and level. Like I brought the level down here a little bit, but I am increasing the energy with the saturator. And then there's another compressor. Oh, you're not seeing my screen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll go through that whole thing again. So here's my channel strip. Yeah, that's why I got to pay attention to the chat. <laughs> Sometimes you forget what you guys are seeing. Um, okay, so here's that de-esser. This is just Live's compressor. It has a de-esser preset right inside of Live. Um, you probably have it if you just go into your audio effects. Compressor, de-esser, and what it's doing, it's got this like 
part for the side chain open. It's just listening for certain frequencies. It's got the curve here and it's pumped up at six and I cranked it up a little bit just so it was more prominent. Again, this could be adjusted a little bit when I actually mix, but um, it's getting rid of a lot of the air sounds because I don't want that stuff in the beginning. Then I move on to my channel strip and I cut out the low end here. Get rid of all that low. That's stuff I just don't need. That's, that's how I like to do everything, honestly. If I know I have a sound that does not need bass, I will cut the bass before anything else happens. I just don't think there's any reason for that extra information to go through all of these other processes before I cut it. So I think I did, yeah, I did a, a video or a podcast about EQ or compression first. And my way of doing it is I get rid of stuff first. I, I cut stuff usually with the EQ, but I, I, I decided to try the de-esser first here this time. Um, so I'm cutting things and it's a little bit of compression here, not too crazy and more compression and uh, a glue compressor after that. I just find instead of like slamming it all at once with the compressor, if I bring it, bring like the dynamics down a little bit and then bring it down on another step, it just, uh, it just sounds smoother. Yeah. Um, serial compression. Then here's that saturator. That's to give it a little more harmonics, energy, excitement, and another compressor after that. And this, this one's much faster than the other ones on a lot of the earlier compressors. Well, maybe not that one, but I do let some of the sound come through first. And then after a while, I get it down. And that's really it other than uh, some kind of on the returns, I got an echo here. So it's doing sort of like a slap back. So I'll let you hear it. I had a feeling that something totally was dry. wrong. I didn't believe it. I waited too That's long. Echo slap and it's back. not going to be magic. That's, That's up, up to, to you. you. Ain't no kind of magic gonna do the work for you. And I'm not married to that sound. You know, that might change. Um, yeah, I'm sure it probably will. But it's really just for me to get the feeling. You know, so when I'm singing, I can feel it. And I find having some reverb, a little bit of delay. I don't have reverb on this track, but on other ones I do. Um, I just find it makes me feel like better about my voice. And that's important because like we said earlier it's so like <laughs> difficult to be comfortable singing um especially for me it just uh I w it takes a lot so um i i do that and i think also just hearing the little bit of a tail afterwards helps me a little bit with my pitch i think it helps me just like hear what i'm doing a little better and I've set this one up now. So if we go into our current project, which has a bunch of these songs on here, I have one of these tracks. It's called Vocal Template. And it's just that exact vocal chain. I can just drop it into any session. And there it is. So I've got something set up for every time I go to do vocals. Um, it's got the mic ready to go. It's cranked up loud so I can hear it. And it's got all of these uh, compressors and EQs and stuff on it. And then I can just add the sends and stuff. So that's really helpful. And it's helping me like, just be consistent throughout. So when I go to record a track, I can just drop that in there and I'm ready to go. I can delete that. And that's just nice and easy to use. You guys have any questions on any of that stuff? Did I miss anything, especially like maybe when my screen was uh, not being shared? I can always just Do you ever try. use like anything to tune your vocals? To tune my vocals? Like, yeah, like. Um, no way, I never need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my I vocals do. are usually like, there's always pitch issues and I just, you just I just have to keep doing take lanes until I get it, but mm -hmm. I'm sure there's an easier way. I just don't know how. Yeah. Um, so what do I have? Uh, 
I have a couple different plugins for that. Like I got the isotope uh, nectar, which is kind of cool. Um, I think I have a waves tune. Yeah, waves tune in there. Um, I don't have like the real auto tune and Tara's auto tune. Um, but those are the ones I tend to use. I don't have it going on these songs right now. I, I just, uh, I don't want to have to <laughs> because I think like this kind of music sounds better with a more raw voice and um, not so, nothing on this is perfect. You know, none of our performances are perfect. We played along to a click, but it's not quantized. Um, so, you know, in this type of music, I'm I'm trying to avoid that. I'm trying to avoid the auto tune, but in like other stuff, um, yeah, I, I have no problem with that. Um, I I actually like them a lot for, um, you know, putting like an auto tune on just to like figure out melodies and stuff. You know, like I'll just set the key of the song and just sing, blabbering usually until I figure out the words, and. Um, it just helps you find melodies, I think. And sometimes as you're singing, you hit like notes that you probably wouldn't hit. The auto tune like corrects you to a note like you probably wouldn't try to sing and you can get some cool like voicings and harmonies out of that. So <clears throat> I do like it. I like it like live while I'm singing to come up with melodies sometimes. But I'm trying not to do that for this stuff. Um, right. So far, so good. You know, I don't know, You maybe you think it could be tuned or not but uh i i think like if i were going to use it on this it would be in a way to try to be like unnoticeable yeah. right yeah no no i think it sounds really good it's just i was just asking for my personal preference because some of my vocals are already out of tune <laughs> yeah me too to fix it. here's the thing though i will say about this um for these songs like we've been playing them as a band uh, i mean we started playing like about about a year ago and somewhere in the first few months these songs all kind of came out of those jams but there's been a lot of like rehearsal like we play like pretty much every week and go through the set a couple times and um i'm working on them a lot you know so like i have a pretty good idea of like how i want to um deliver the lines, the melodies, figure it out, like the exact wording of things. That's sometimes a fun thing to do. Like I, I have no problem like twisting the grammar around a little bit so it fits nicely, <laughs> you know? Um, but if it's like a brand new song, like I don't have that stuff worked out. And a lot of times like an auto tune will really help. It kind of like keeps you on the track, you know? It's like lanes on the highway compared to like a dirt road. You're just right, using right. that for uh, like composing the melody, right? And then you're trying to sing it normally after that. Depends on the song. It depends. I I have like some songs, like especially in, like the live set I do, that uh, I like the auto tune on it. You know, I like the like because it's more electronic, so I like the kind of stepped. It's not too extreme. I you know just not because I have a problem with that or anything. Just I just felt it. You know, like sometimes, um, I don't know if you guys have ever had that issue where like you make like a very like electronic digital type song and then you play like a real instrument over it or you sing over it and it just sounds like too loose. Like I've found that with like my guitars sometimes like everything else is in perfect tune and then you play your guitar and it's never in perfect tune. There's always some issues with the tuning whether it's the guitar is not intonated right or just the way you press your fingers down on the string there's a little variation and sometimes i find it difficult to make that gel so with my voice especially sometimes autotune works nice with that yeah that makes sense if it's with the vibe um, yeah, it's now on the topic of just uh tuning like individual notes to make them sound natural i've got some tips on that if you want to hear them yeah yeah Okay, so um, there's a few different plugins that can do the similar thing, like Melodyne. I use the Waves Tune just because I have it. But what it does is it'll scan your whole vocal melody. And then you use that plugin interface 
like instead of your DAW to basically to automate it. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you like you turn off all the automatic pitch correction and everything. So it's just playing everything through like normal. But then you have the ability to just slightly tweak individual notes if you want to using the waveform that they got. And so if you, you can do it so that it has smooth curves and everything, so it doesn't sound robotic at all, and it retains all your vibrato and everything. So that's a really great way to just fix if you have just a few notes that are off and you just can't nail them. That's definitely happened to me before where my voice just doesn't want to hit those notes perfectly. So it's, sometimes it's just easier just to, to fix one or two notes. Yeah, like Melodyne is nice because you can just kind of like drag these. I, I had an old version of Melodyne at one point. And, yeah, with uh, Melodyne, you have control over all the harmonics too, which can get crazy. It's like, it's too much power because you can really make it sound unnatural. But right. that too, that could be useful if you've got a, a piano that's out of tune and there's just some harmonic that's rubbing weird in there or something. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, yeah, I, I really like feel like one day you're going to see this in live. <laughs> I'm like hoping, you know, like, um, cause there are like, I know Cubase, I think logic also, you can like really easily right inside the, inside their native, uh, audio editor or whatever. You can just do all this stuff. It's pretty cool. But <clears throat> yeah, that's one thing that's cool about Melodyne is that you can just do like specific notes really easily. Right. timing yeah, and the same thing with the waves tune oh yeah like i figured out um there's like two tools there's there's like a little tool set you have for like manipulating the waveform in waves tune there's like two that i use all the time where i'll just i'll grab a little section and then i can like tweak it up or down but your, your natural like little ups and downs and your dips and stuff it preserves all of that you're just tweaking up the overall thing to like mm. get it inside the note that you wanted if, if you're like half step off you know i have the curse of, of hitting a note just like exactly one half step off which is the worst possible interval <laughs> yeah i'm gonna just yeah. open uh nectar here yeah uh, oh this is the new one I, I keep forgetting there's a new one i'm so used to uh two and i i liked to Two, yeah, I don't know if Nectar has the waveform view or if that's just more auto tune style. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, I have the really old one where they don't update it anymore. Yeah, this this one is cool because it's got like a mixing and a tracking mode, so like you can use it like live. It's with like less latency, a little less accuracy. Nice. Um, you know, there's more artifacts, but I I use this when I play live. I just have this ready to go if I want to turn it on in in the tracking mode. It's got that then you can just get your settings and then switch the mode after you're ready to mix. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I and I'm doing it live, so you know it's there's there's not enough latency where it's a problem. And uh, yeah, like things like adjusting like the speed, how fast they go, um, that that makes a really big difference, you know. But uh, the format is something I always really liked changing. Like you do like a really low voice, you know. The, it changes like the shape of your throat basically yeah or like turn off format correction so it sounds more like the old school like tape pitch shifting like the beatles did and stuff yeah yeah it's cool like it's simple you know i always like nectar for that it's like simple it's low cpu and uh yeah it's i think uh you know this I don't think there's any reason to be like a purist about it, you know, um, like to, I, I'm not like that. I'm not above it or below it or anything, you know, I think just like all of this stuff, like, look, I'm using takes, like, how is this any less, um, you know, real than using auto tune or punching in even like, it's not the same take every time, but so like when I'm, uh, Recording though, what I do think is really nice about like setting up like a loop for like just one part of the song like this is you can just sing it as many times as you need to. It looks like I set my loops like right there. You can actually just see pretty much where I did it based on where these clips end. And um, you just record and then it, I leave myself enough time in the beginning to like catch my breath and enough time afterwards to like compose myself 
and uh, it comes back around and I sing it again. And I find that if I'm just focusing on the one section, it helps me really like refine it, really pay attention to like specific notes I wanna hit, uh, the delivery of the words. And I find that it makes like uh, more consistent takes. And a lot of times, like if I'm doubling things, like I did in the, I wonder if I have an example of that here in this song. Um, verse, did I double here? This is a pre-chorus verse. I, do that. I know I did it on this part actually, um, this end part. So let me show these take lanes. So this is the part, it's just like ooze and ah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just recorded a bunch of these and then I don't think we're going to see many take lanes on these. Yeah, there are no take lanes on this one. Um, I can just take like the ones I like, like say this one was really good. I'll just option drag it down to an empty spot just like that just make sure I keep it in the same position option drag let go and it makes a whole copy of that entire track with all of the devices in there and I've got like another layer of this just like that so by looping a section and singing it over and over again um, a lot of times my doubles are there so if I'm going to layer things and double things up Sometimes you just, if you do enough of them and you do them right, um, you can just do that. And if you need to, you can make new takes. Sometimes I'll just double it and then comp it together. But it's nice that, um, you know, you just have a whole bunch of options right here. And sometimes you have your doubles ready to go. You don't even have to record them again. I'll tend to like, if I'm singing like a part, I'll tend to... If I get one, I think that felt really good, I'll keep going, you know? And once I, once I feel like I got to that point, like in, like, I think this happened on the verse in this song, um, wherever my verse is, there we go. <laughs> so I think I, I did one I kind of liked, maybe these like two or something, and then just do another one, do a couple more. And sometimes, I think once I feel like I got it, I'm looser, I'm having more fun, I'm not as uptight. And a lot of times the ones I do after that are better. And I wind up going with those. Um, and then you kind of also have the freedom to like mess around. You can kind of try things you wouldn't normally do and uh, mix things up, you know, take risks where, cause sometimes that happens. Like when I, I know like when we're playing live, like everything's loose and you know just yelling and trying things out and being weird but when you go to record all of a sudden you get like all proper and stiff so after having this loop a bunch of times i'm just kind of loose and i feel like i might have a good one in there so I'll, then i'll just fool around and have fun so that's a, a thing i love so much about the take lanes these days is you just kind of zero in on a section like the verse here. And then once I get that, I'll go to the second verse and record the second verse and uh, try to get that one right. And since I'm singing similar melodies, it's, I've kind of got it dialed in and it's a little bit easier. You can see like uh, for the second verse, it didn't take as many tries. Um, and then I move on to the different sections like the pre-chorus then the chorus and all of that. Um, part by part, I think is really nice because you can really, focus in on the details, you know. Um, and uh, something I learned too in doing this, like let's say like, you know, I comp together like a pre-chorus I really liked, like right here, I'm like, oh, that was really good, but I, I wanna try to do it again. You can just, again, you can option drag these right into take lanes. So now this compilation of those, I guess just two right here, but now that's in on this take lane. So if I record another, you know, try at this, 
Uh, let's move you guys out of the way. You know, I don't, I don't lose it. So if I were to hit record here. Yeah, so I'm singing it over here. Whatever, I, I can have fun do it. And, you know, ordinarily you would lose all that take information you did. But since I have this here, I can highlight it and listen to it. Or I can say, you know what, that just didn't work. Where'd that take go? It's all the way down here. You know, that didn't work, so I can just select it. Um, I was going to drag it up, but I could just hit enter. And now it's back to where I had it. So that was something I found I ran into. Like I would do these like comps of like multiple tracks, but then I was like, oh no, like I can't record because then I lose all that information, but you can just drag it into another take lane. So they're so cool take lanes. Like it's not just what you recorded, but you can put anything. I put in a sample of whatever I grab here and into a take lane. And there it is. Like it's, it's not going to make any sense, but this is. No, man. No, can't be. You can do whatever you want, really. So they're, they're so helpful. That saved me a ton of time. And also, just like I said before, the fact that you can drag anything from a track like it did over here you know you can just if i drag option drag this to another track it just preserves everything it just makes a copy so you don't have to do like duplicate you can just just drag things down super handy and the comping is great you know you just pick the parts you like highlight them hit enter or you can drag them like that, or you can do the pencil tool, press the B key or that button and just draw what you want. And a lot of times when I'm auditioning, like say I'm trying to figure out like, uh, what was the best, like, I don't know, like we'll maybe do these, right? Like these. Love me with you. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, uh, Click the, uh, aud I guess that's the audition button there. And listen Love to it. With you. I'll just compare. Love me with you. Love me with you. Until I find the one I like. I'm like, all right, I like that one here. Hit enter, and then I'll listen to the next one. Love me with you. If I feel like I need to go through it that way. It's very easy to just test out each one. Audition them. Until you get what you like. We uh, we talked a little bit about doubling, I, I think, like before we started. And um, I find uh, doubling is great for like sprinkling in um, maybe like certain lines you want to emphasize. You know, like in general, I, I don't usually double like the verses too much. I kind of let those go on their own. But sometimes like it can be pretty nice to have like. I had a Wrong. Like maybe bring it in on like those that word like something is wrong. Uh, that I had a feeling that's so like we will just zero that out. I had a feeling that something was wrong. And you know, take it out for this one. I didn't believe it. Waited too long. You know, you can use it for like coloring and just giving like lines a little extra energy. I'll probably be experimenting with that. I mean, at this stage of the game, though, I'm not really like thinking about like the vocal mix so much. I'm just trying to get performances I can live with without cringing <laughs> every time I hear it. That's kind of the goal, you know? that part of the track which part is the tom petty vibe out of curiosity that's not, that's great to hear is that the would that be the verse or the chorus the chorus cool yeah that's that's fun i love tom petty <laughs> um i don't know you guys have any questions comments or anything on any of this at this point
I Paul, probably wouldn't go around. Oh, hey, Paul. It... Sorry, temporary unmute doesn't work too well. Um, <clears throat> when you were copying together some of those, uh, uh, I think the, the yeah, yeah, yeah is near the end, it looked like you were selecting bits that, yeah, exactly, that, that uh, you don't get a clean break in between the the audio signal like you're you're at like measure 903 right you're you're cutting okay. right in the middle of a of a this you know, here <laughs> yeah and then the next well actually the next one oh, there yeah yes. between those two between vocal verse two and vocal verse like how do you do that um cleanly enough that you don't get artifacts there might the be two. artifacts here we could listen to it real quick <laughs> I'll play it. Let's see. Few, yeah, yeah. Few, yeah. Few, yeah. There is. Few, yep, little pop there. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, what I'll do, I'll see if I can get away with it. You know, I'll do a Few, yeah, yeah. Few, yeah, yeah. There you go. Little crossfade usually does the trick. Um, and, and plus, like, I am singing the same thing mostly. Few, yeah, yeah. Compared to. Few, yeah, yeah. You know, they're pretty close. So if I usually the crossfade does the trick. See, I didn't even go through this to do the crossfading. Yeah. That's kind of like an abrasive F too. I'd probably, I don't know, depending on how it sounds in the context, I guess. I might try to make that F a little less <laughs> aggressive or something. But yeah, usually it's just a little crossfade, really short. Um, if... I'm consistent enough, it, it tends to work. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask or, or point out that is that your volume is pretty consistent across the takes, it looks like, <clears throat> just visually. And that's because of the looping thing. You know, I I, I just, whenever I do these, I, I just set up like the loop kind of like that and just, Let me do, do, do. and then just uh, go for it. I, I, I think I did like the whole chorus, you know? And I probably had it. You could probably just actually see where I, yeah, I put the loop right here because that's where it starts and it probably ends right about there. Yeah. And that gives me enough time to like feel it coming. Can't find the feeling. Love me with you. Gives me a little chance to get my breath and another little chance over here. <clears throat> yeah. But because I'm doing them one after another after another, like I'm. I'm just so focused on this that it is a little bit easier to make sure my takes are consistent with each other. You can see like certain things, like I think this is a line where I kind of change it a little. You, I love me, yeah, like, like, I love... like that's like a little change. And I probably did it like a different way this time. I love me, yeah, so like these I was fooling around with, but you know, got one that I liked, and this one looks pretty similar. The other ones are a little more. Sometimes it's a little bit of a matching game. You know, like those like pictures you see, and it's like, what's the difference between these pictures? It's like, you know, the shirt has a different wrinkle. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm doing that when I'm playing around with this. <clears throat> so what I found with those little tiny crossfades is um, to like totally minimize possible artifacts usually it's best to try to make them as small as possible because if i used to think that like a longer smoother one was better but then you increase the chances of the two the phase of the two waveforms like not lining up right and yeah. causing a weird like temporary phaser effect yeah that's true if i do something like that probably sound even like zoom in really 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 close and see the individual you can hear like a doubling effect not too bad on that one. Yeah, I can hear it though. Few, yeah, yeah. Few, yeah. Sounds like two people said few. Few? With you. That's I'm saying with you, not few. <laughs> yeah, but like really get in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's definitely something like to listen for. You know, like pay attention. I'll go through this definitely on solo. You know. Like you've probably heard people say you shouldn't mix in solo. This isn't like mixing. This is the more like technical stuff of uh, 
making sure there's no problems. Like I have a feeling like I might get some kind of issue here. I have to work on, but getting um, rid of all the little pops and stuff. Yeah. Just listening for the pops. Um, that's a lot easier to hear in solo. It's very easy to miss them when you're in the context of the mix. And that's also, I guess, worth keeping in mind. Like if you have something you just can't quite get rid of in solo, listen in the mix, you might not hear it. You might. Yeah. Or like the DSing thing earlier, like maybe that was right when a symbol hit a crash. So you, you want the F to be able to poke through. Or you yeah. Yeah. It. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always important to like hear it in context. No one's going to hear it like this on its own. So it doesn't need to, nothing needs to be perfect on their own. In fact, like a lot of times uh, on some things, like some of my guitars probably, I didn't really do much to them yet. But sometimes when I do guitars, when I'm mixing them, well, like the acoustics is a good example, right? And again, these, I'm not saying anything's mixed. I'm going to have to do a lot of that still, but, but I'm cutting out like a ton of stuff. Unmute all this. Like if this was just like a, an acoustic song, I would never have that much EQ off on, on the low end. But what I'm using the acoustics for in this song is, uh, here we go. Ready? It's more texture. Yeah, one of my metal tracks has acoustic guitars layered in, and it basically it's cutting out all the lows just like that, because all I really need is the sparkle in there. The low end just adds a bunch of boxy rumble that doesn't help anything at all. Yeah, exactly. So on their own, like, they sound like thin. Also, I think I'm playing up. Yeah, if you were performing that acoustic solo, you wouldn't want that sound. Yeah. These acoustics are actually two guitars at the same time, uh, just on opposite sides of the mic, which I found was a really fun way to do acoustics. They just have like a nice little spread out jangle. Get a free uh, like 3D binaural effect that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we use this mic actually. We set it to the figure eight pattern so that it's picking up on both sides. We just put it right in between us and we just both played uh, guitars at the same time on one track and then we switched guitars and did what we did before again so it's it's actually even though it's two tracks it's four guitars because I'm, I'm just getting the jangle of the bounce for like this this like this kind of grand finale so we're not gonna we're not going to miss the low end. We're just trying to get texture there. So things don't need to sound good on their own. <laughs> and a lot of times, like a good mix, I find like a lot of stuff sounds kind of terrible on its own, but it's about how they work together. Yeah. I guess like making a cake, you know, you wouldn't just eat like, uh, I don't know, whatever's in a cake on its own. <laughs> I found that's definitely true for lead guitar a lot of the time. Like sometimes they sound really cool by themselves, but other times they just sound thin and harsh by themselves. Like you would never want to just listen to that by itself. But in the yeah. mix, that's what it needs to poke through everything else. Yeah, that's what I did here, right? Like this little solo here. I cut all that low out. This is, looks like a little take action going on. Took a few tries, <laughs> but I liked whatever I did there, you know, I'm like, I think on this one too, I was still like learning what I was going to play. I have an idea, I guess, but yeah, I was still trying to figure out the part, but, um, yeah, cutting that out. Like we just don't need it, right? Like none of those notes are in that range. Just those first couple notes, really. Dude. Yeah, I mean that sounded good by itself, but in the mix, it sounds so much better. It sounds awesome. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Glad you like it. It's fun writing guitar solos. I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs>
I've told you guys before. I know I've said it on the podcast. I listen to so much Cars lately in the last year. And uh, Elliot Easton is like such a big influence guitar. And like he always talks about his solos. It's not like him just ripping through scales and playing fast. He's, he's composing like little melodies you can remember. So I'm thinking that way a lot in the solos. I, I don't even, I never really get too excited about like when people just sort of like rip on a guitar just to like show us how fast they can play. I, I like melody and like a compositional like thing for the solos. Yeah. Can you name the take lanes? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Good take. Yep, you can. Just the same way. Command R. Um, and you can totally give them no name, too. <laughs> you can't color them, though. You can color the regions, the clips here. And I do that sometimes when I like, oh, I know this was like a really good part. I want to make sure I, I remember. I'll like color it. But um, you can't color the take lane themselves, which... You can probably do that just to keep things cohesive so you it's, can like re probably... really tell which track it's in. It's probably a good idea, you know, because I'm sure. I mean, it's it's so easy to get lost in your colors. I just I had the thought, though, it'd be cool if you could randomly audition the take lanes. So you could do a bunch of takes and then, like, randomly go through them. Hmm. You know, like a blind test. There's a plugin that can do that. But that'd be cool if that was just built in. Yeah. That would be kind of fun. Like, it just switches between them. That's almost, I guess you could kind of do something similar with, like, uh, session view right you could probably can you drag these into session i've never tried probably have to consolidate first it wants them to be on different tracks it looks like or are these i don't know i have too many of these to think about hmm i guess maybe you could do it one by one right with this this is the vocal Interesting. Uh, I don't know what the heck this would sound like? Probably be all out of time with each other. Hmm. Not much on that one. Not the way I expected, though, where it would just, you would have to do this, I guess. One by one. And then you could guess you could do some follow actions here. Um, here we go, follow actions. Yeah, if you like consolidate uh, each track Got into it. region of time and then drag them in, that could probably work. Yeah, like the same. Yeah, we could have it, I guess, something like this anyway. Make it other. And we'll make it happen, what, every... Man. I don't see it yet. I haven't used follow actions in a minute in Live 11. I'm forgetting how they work. There we go. So we'll get them all every. Yeah, this, this one's the bogus one, right? This is just like a really short clip. I guess you could, you know, finagle it, right? Make them all loop too. And then you could just listen to them randomly through and then like kind of let yourself relax. And then when you, when something pops out to your ears, like write a note on the clip or whatever. Yeah. Set up another track to just listen to this. What track would that be? Something like that, right? <laughs> I don't think it works with the clips like that, but yeah, we we got the theory. In, yeah. yeah, this is definitely not perfect, but hey, you could get some cool effects, glitchy stuff, right? Invented a new uh, production technique you now. Yeah, 
Add some beat repeat, maybe. It almost sounds like it has yeah. beat repeat on it. It's <laughs> funny. Jeff to use us for a glitch breakdown in the song now. Yep, now we recorded all that on here. <laughs> like an old, uh, I don't even know what it sounds like. I thought it sounded like Space Invaders or something for a second, but not anymore. Yeah, what the heck, right? A lot of possibilities for fun. I cannot save this. I remember. Let's do save as. Or just so I don't screw this up. Experiment. It's <laughs> not how you spell experiment, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. On that note, Brian, I, I wanted to ask him. Um, how do you like if you're if you're trying to make vocals a bit weird or do something a bit fun with them like what's what's your kind of go to effects for vocals um well let me see here uh let's go in here see if i can just pull it out um i i always go with this here uh my live set where would be a good number Probably something around here. Let's see. So I have like a vocal. I got to clean this all up. But uh, let's see. Vocals. Might be under here. Mic effects. Let's let that load as I try to drag it onto the track here. And is my oh, you're not even plugged in. All right, never mind. Um, where are we here? So let's set this to be an external input. We'll use this mic for now. I'll move you guys over here. Okay. So uh, this is the. Uh, this is what I use for my uh, live set. Um, let me get this plugged in. It's not easy. It's not easy. I don't have that thing connected. Um, so uh, this whole effect chain, I use this in my live performance. I think in the uh, the course, the uh, live performance course, which is in the downloads for the music production club. I should have this in there. It's like a, a preset, I believe. If not, just let me know and I'll I'll get it to you. But I've got a delay. It starts there. And where does this delay originate? There's a lot going on here. Might be this. No, it's not that one. Let's see. Where are you? There it is. That's this guy. Hey. Yep, this is the one. So it's set to re-pitch mode. And I can just turn the knob to turn it. It's off at zero. And as soon as I turn the knob, it comes on. So this is especially for live performance. I'll have it like uh, set up on a controller. Um, I don't know why am I... Controls aren't showing up here. There we go. Um, effect. We got our delay. There we go. So I can just turn a knob and affect that. Um, I've got a reverb right here, but it also dulls out my voice. So that would be this. I wanted like an effect that made me sound like far away. 
and that's what I use this reverb for. So it's, I use this like dry wet thing, but um, as I turn that control, let's lock this to push. So I, I click off, it doesn't change anything. And when I do that, you'll see I'm also reducing the high end that goes into the reverb and it gives me this kind of far away feeling. Um, I've got beat repeat. So it's right here. And it, beat repeat is set so that this knob turns on the device as soon as I turn it. And you can, I'll show you how that's done. Um, where is it right here? Beat repeat on. So it's set the minimum at one. So as soon as I get past one, which is any slight turn in the knob, the beat repeat comes on. And it also, it also, it also changes, changes, changes the grid the side. Grid side changes the grid side. So, changes the grid side. Change, change, change. A lot of times, like when I'm playing, I'll just be like, da, 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 da. just grab something and sing in a song, and I want to say, hey, 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 and right next to it, I have the pitch on the beat repeat right here, so I can do this. Some effect I like to play around with there. Um, there is an auto tune, as you can see there. That's connected to this rack. Let's close some of these out. And that's the nectar. And when I turn this knob, which I actually think I have set to a button, it turns on auto tune. And then is it? It's hard for me to tell if it's affecting my voice. Ooh. <laughs> I might need to um, see the way I have this whole thing set up. It's normally goes with my APC 40 and like I push the button and sometimes it affects a couple buttons at once, but I can change the key. That's not mapping up though. So I would have to go in here. Why is that not mapping up? Auto tune key. So that changes the root note. Um, root. Do we see root here? I might have to click configure. I'm not sure where. Oh, here it is. Root right here. Looks like it should be mapped. Um, let's just unmap it and map it again here. There we go. Sometimes that happens for whatever reason. I'm gonna close that up. Uh, but you can see, like, I can change the key. It's changing that root note right there with that that knob. That though, I have set up. Um, I'll set like just a clip to change that for me. I'll put automation on a clip and have that change for me. So I don't have to really do that. It just happens with the song, but I can turn that on and off nice and easy. Um, what else? There's some chorus. So these would be a button on my APC 40. I can just hit for the chorus to turn it on just to give it a, you can hear what it's doing, right? Like phasey kind of thing. Um, there's radio voice. This would be a button too. And all this is, is it just, uh, moves me to that. So I sound like I'm coming out of a radio. It's just a very drastic EQ. Um, over and along, we talked about the reverb. We talked about delay. I've got these, like what I call one word delays. And all that does, I guess it's a little more. I made a uh, a rack. This like this one's available to download somewhere. I'm sure if you write in Ableton one word delay, uh, I think I did it on DJ Tech Tools actually. I'll look that up. Um, DJ Tech Tools probably my name. It'll come up. But um, what happens here? Is, is, is once is, I turn that knob, it's it's like a a delay throw they might call it too. Um, uh, it 
right now the gate is not letting anything out. So I've got two chains. My dry is going through normally as you would expect, but I don't know why it's called radio. I probably just duplicated that rack, but this would really be called delay. And as soon as I turn this, it disables the gate and allows the signal to go through the delay. And this gets all compressed. And I think I actually have it set. Normally this would be set to my input, which is this exact channel, pre-FX. So it's, it's a compressor after the delay so that when I turn on the delay, real quick, if I turn, I turn it on, it on. I'm compressing the delayed signal with my voice so it's not as loud and you can hear me talk more compared to if I just have it like this and it's not compressing. It's probably harder to understand me. But the way this one works, usually I'll just be like singing and I want to delay a word and I just hit a button. I have that on a foot pedal so I can just press down on the foot pedal and when I hold down the pedal it will give me delay and when I let go the delay goes off so I can be singing a song and I want to say hey and I only want hey to get delay and I can just say hey and only hey gets delayed <laughs> so that's like fun for emphasis and stuff and then I use, I use a vocoder it's in here somewhere This one won't be set up though, because I'm not in the session. I don't have the synth going, but I have a vocoder too. That's really what I do live. Um, on this music though, that I'm showing you, I don't think there's going to be, turn that off a little bit weird here in my voice. I don't think um, there's going to be anything too crazy. Maybe like a little a delay throw here and there. Um, maybe the little reverb, just kind of more natural stuff. I'm not going to be like chopping things, reversing things and all that kind of stuff. I just don't think this, you know, this type of song, this type of music calls for that so much. No, I love the clarity in, the, in this tune. It's, it's really nice to hear that. It's, yeah, without those, too uh, much. Yeah, but the, those racks are, uh, cool it's way ahead of me but just to see that that's a possibility is super super cool they took a while you know like i didn't just make them on day one you know it was like if you're especially when you're like performing live like the best thing you can do is just just start jamming you know whatever you want to accomplish with your live set just try playing it even if you only have like one knob you're turning in the beginning like as you go through like playing a song, you'll realize, oh, I wish I had a knob for this. And then you add that knob in and then you'll say, oh, I, it'd be cool if I could ha have a filter go across the whole channel. Then you'll add the filter in there. And just over the course of doing it and doing it and doing it, these things just build and grow. And that's really how this worked. This just started building and growing. And that's that's why like I think uh on some of these, like the labeling's off, like that that said radio, because I probably just doubled this one, duplicated it, and just swapped out the effect. <clears throat> yeah, but um yeah, it's fun. Like that's that's a really fun part of playing live is like discovering what you want to do and seeing if you can figure out a way to do it. It's it's a puzzle, you know, like every time um, I'm trying to work on it, it's like you're figuring something to try. I'm like, oh, oh, let's see, could I do that? Like, I know I could have probably just used like a send to do those like delay throws I was talking about, just put it on a send. Um, but I just wanted everything contained in that one rack like this. So for organizational purposes and um, I just found that to be like a, a good way to do it. There's a lot of different ways to do the same thing, I guess. I just, but I don't think there's going to be too much of that on these songs. Maybe there'll be like a radio voice part somewhere on something. Like I said, maybe a couple delays here and there, but I think it's going to be meant to sound more natural, more like a band. You know, that's what we are. So. It's fun. 
Um, question, circling back to earlier, somebody said that, I think it was Paul said, the, um, you can see visually the consistency in the takes, the the volume of the takes. And and I think that you made a great point, Brian. Thanks for doing this, by the way. This is awesome. Oh, of course. This is fun. I'm uh, glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, no, like, you know, going through and doing a bunch of takes, you get in a rhythm and and um, there's a consistency to like your your volume and your your pitch and stuff like that. You get in on a roll. But do you, I was going to ask, do you use a, a outboard compressor going in? Like, and do you, part A and part B is, do you think you can get away with not using one? <laughs> like if you don't have one? Yeah, you can, I'm not using one. I actually have one too. Uh, it, I mean, it's nothing too, it's the Alesis, uh 3610, 36, 3630. It's, I think like Daft Punk used it a lot for like side chaining. Um, but it's just... It was like a hundred dollar compressor, I think. I'm not even using it though. Um, I thought about it, but uh, I don't know. I, 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 I maybe I sort of forgot halfway <laughs> as I was going. Um, yeah, you don't need any of that stuff to do this. You know, sometimes it's fun and it's nice. It's cool sometimes to just have a thing that's dedicated with its knobs there that you can play with. But um, it's definitely not a requirement. You know. And I think if you can, it's good to bring in two lines, one that's dry and one that's with the outboard gear if possible, then you can listen because it may or may not sound better. Yeah, that, I mean, that's definitely a thing. Like sometimes you run stuff through these, you know, any if I'm going to run my mic through this compressor, it's going to get printed with the compressor on. I'm recording it through the compressor um, and I'm stuck with it. If I screw that up, I can't fix it. If I screw up this compressor, which I probably did, I can just change it. It's nice and easy like that. Um, but what Animus says is a good point. Like you could also just record it twice on two separate tracks. That would work too. Um, I could set up like, um, you know, the external audio device. Where are you external audio device? I probably even have it. I don't know if I have it routed. I might need to play around with the patch bay to get this right. But in fact, I know I yeah, will. Yeah, just apply it later. I do that with the two preamps all the time. Yeah, right. You can just do it later. So like, um, rather than watching me fiddle around my wires quick, like I can have like this go out. So yeah, it's not even configured. We could have it going out. It's whatever output it would be. I'd have to set that up and then come back in. And then my voice will get compressed through the gear without it being recorded. Um, the only, I guess, th the advantage is of this is also the problem of this is if I change anything on that compressor, it's not going to be remembered within this device because this is literally just sending audio out of my computer and through whatever is there in this case it would be the compressor and then out of the compressor back into the computer so it's it's really a, this is a great device the external audio effect because you can process things through external gear without having to commit to it but if i decide to change the settings then i, I lose that that's pretty cool not i mean compression would be a pretty like pedestrian way to use it if you really wanted to but like this is more creative stuff and like yeah. you know run it out through cool stuff and yeah, yeah i have a mooger fuger delay that it is, oh. is super old and i can't use the tap tempo so i don't use it as much as i used to to play guitar other than just as a reverb you know i just leave it on the guitar because it makes everything sound cool but nice. it, it's like i'm always thinking i should just put this on the like s send stuff out to this kind of like little pedal board that i use only for this purpose it's a project I've been meaning to do. So you guys have inspired me. I should do that because I yeah. never use the external audio effect like to route stuff very often. Here's another question. And maybe this is too in the weeds and I don't want to monopolize everyone's time. So for Brian and anybody else here. So in compression, like, could you walk through just, I'm particularly um, bad at setting the attack and the release. I mean, release is fine and you can hear it. 
but the attack of the compressor. And I understand kind of the basic comment concepts when you're dealing with drums and stuff like that, and whether you want to let a transient through and stuff like that. But with vocals though, can you talk about how you set the attack of the compressors or is that too much minutia for folks? Cause chime in if there's better things to talk about, people just feel free to jump in. No, I think it's worth saying I'm not claiming I've, I didn't spend a ton of time figuring this out on this particular track. Um, but there are definitely like some, I'm sure we could look at the waveform and see like there are certain words that just have a lot more energy and like these little peaks here, like if they are a problem, we might want to set a fast attack somewhere along the way. Um, for me with vocals, I try and it might not be, there might not be evidence of that here <laughs> right now, but when I really do it, I try to be a little more gentle with everything just to keep it more natural sounding. But in this kind of music too, sometimes it might make sense to just really squeeze the hell out of it and squish it a little bit so it fits nice. Um, but like the attack of a sound is often like the part that we identify the sound by. Um, like, like a piano, for instance, if you take out that initial attack of the piano and just start like from the middle, it's a lot harder to tell it's a piano. So sometimes like that's where a lot of the character is in a sound is that impact. So you might want to like leave a little time. Not, I didn't do that here, but um, let that stuff come through a little bit. If you have something that's just got way too much attack, sometimes like acoustic guitars, like if I mic them a certain way, like the pick is just a little bit out of control, then I might really want that attack to compress and I might have a really fast release. So I'm just getting that initial like clicking, picking sound out of there. It can almost be like a de -esser or to augment a de -esser. Yeah. Because like the example of the acoustic guitar, sometimes you just really get a lot of pick noise and that it like throws everything off and it becomes like uh, kind of annoying almost. But at the same time, if you get rid of all of that, then it doesn't cut through the mix as much either. So it's, it's a little balance. Um, I think like a lot of my vocals are probably more like barky <laughs> you know like they they have a lot of like it's not as i'm not like really holding notes very long for the most part i don't think um so like you got pretty fast attack values on your compressors in there yeah i do and, and again like i'm i would i would revisit all of this when it's time um I think vocals can absorb like fast attack a lot better than a lot of instruments without really noticing audibly. And I think part of it is like when you look at the waveforms, there's this little slope up. So it, the compressor kind of has a little chance to like realize, oh, there's a peak coming up. Yeah. It depends on the sounds too. Like the consonants are usually like, they can be a problem. Like where like the C sound on consonant sometimes it's just like really intense and everything else is softer. Um, that can be. Usually what I'll do with that is I'll just automate, I'll just slice out that little part of clip and then bring down the volume on the clip volume of that and then fade it in. Yeah, something like this, just. Uh... Yeah, because sometimes no compressor or limiter can just can do it right. You just got to bring the volume. Yeah, sometimes you got to ride the fader as they say right you know and or even just get in there and be like look this is just too loud right here we need to command e separate that and just bring it down a little bit yeah exactly and like you said do a little crossfade or something because your attack and release might be perfect for most of the track but just one little spot like you can either automate your attack and release to change or just do the volume there this is another reason why i like to do the uh verses and choruses separate on different tracks i mean like look at this particular what am i saying here oh, no. like that part yeah, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Can't fight the even there like you see like this does that fight, fight the 
It's loud. Like I I just find uh this this track is a little more consistent. Just I'm kind of yelling the whole time. But in this part right here, uh it's, I guess it's actually here where I did it. These are quiet. Can't find the feeling. So I might want that on another track. I did it separately, but I did it on the same track. Um, that I might want to treat that differently because it's not going to be hitting my compressors the same as some of that other stuff was. Yeah, you might not need it for that to an attack. Yeah. Can't find the it's hardly hitting any of this stuff. It's not even Can't DS. Find the that got the F right there. <laughs> Whereas I noticed, like uh, here in the beginning of the song, like it's kind of. I had a feeling that so, so I mean, this is almost like pointless in a way. Or you can alter the threshold if you need to, if you if you want it to dig in a little bit. Yeah, I probably would need to pull that up a little, and it it's just like a it's a totally different signal here than it is here. It's like twice as loud or more. So this might need like its own little track yeah, not so, a bad idea yeah so not... hit the pre-chorus one there please just want to listen to that pre-chorus that marker pre-chorus one or pre-chorus two no. okay Okay, and then the verse, the first verse, right? Play that really quick, please. I had a feeling that something was wrong. I didn't believe it. I waited too long. And it's not going to be magic. That's up to you. Ain't no kind of magic going to do work for you. Awesome, dude. This is such a good song. The dynamics in this song are so punchy on all the instruments, too. There's like a bounce to everything, but the whole band is playing like with uh, just really good energy and the performance is really well. It's awesome. So the verse there is like has that snarl like the replacements in my opinion stuff and then that pre-chorus is the tom petty part i was talking about that's awesome <laughs> like it has that and a million other influences i'm sure too but this, this is an awesome track oh glad you like it thanks yeah i like this one it's uh fun it's got like like you said a good bounce and energy i i found like i got a nice bounce by cutting out some of these uh these are like little pauses in the bass. Um, talked about this. Did we talk about this in a class or I made a video? I can't even remember. But uh, th that bass actually has a lot of buzz to it too. But uh, just cut that stuff out. It really made a difference in the bounce. But um, yeah. There, there's like slightly different deliveries, I guess, you know, they probably need separate tracks when the time comes. But again, like this, I think I called it too, like this, the topic of this was recording vocals because um, I, I don't want to get too caught up in mixing the vocals while I'm trying to record them either. Um, because I definitely notice, like in singing, like as like the hours pass, my voice changes, and uh, if I spend too much time on a song, like by the time I get to the end of it, it sounds like a different person singing. So, or or just like I'm in a totally different mood, or sometimes I'm raspier. Uh, so it's it's definitely tempting to like really get into like fine tuning it. Mostly, I think, because I want to hear my voice in a way that doesn't make me cringe. So you start finding yourself doing stuff. But I found that having this track set up with like these settings and having it in here where I can, uh, there's a current project. 
didn't want me to click on the browser. But having like this like track here that I can just drag on and then just run it through like the return just for a little echo. And that just really helps. So like it sounds good enough where I feel I can feel it. I'm having fun. And it's not like um I mean, that's a big part of doing the vocals whenever I record them. It's like the beginning is like torture because like you don't have anything like set up. You don't have like the levels. You don't have a good sound yet. And that, and also I'm usually not, uh, I'm usually not as like well rehearsed on the singing as I am on these songs. So like all of that together can like really like take away from my own like confidence. So it might not be like, I might start thinking like, I'm terrible. I don't know what I'm doing. I shouldn't be singing. Whereas if I just had things sounding a little better, I'd, I'd fall into it a little easier. So it's nice to have that. It's, a, it's good to have like these types of things ready to go in situations like this. So you use those effects chains to get kind of like a sound so you're feeling good and inspired. And then you just, after that, you just focus on capturing some takes, especially the first one, so that all your other, you loosen up on all your other takes, like, and yeah. can mess around, like you're saying, and experiment more. But the focus is just getting takes that you can live with. Yeah, that's it, really. And uh, like I said, I've got uh, uh, five of these done now. And if I open up like another track, like there's one on, uh, no, that's the wrong one. I got it over here. It was back in November, these songs. We did it in like two different projects for some reason. But uh, yeah, this one is probably one I'll do next. Um, and rather than starting from scratch, setting up, everything all these like effects i'm just gonna drag that vocal you know channel right onto the track and just start so I've like got i'm in the ballpark you know right away so like if because if i like start from scratch um for one i might have a lot of inconsistencies in the sound of the vocals throughout the whole album but i'm also the the real thing is that i'm gonna just feel like overwhelmed you know, i'm just going to take this vocal template and just drag it right on this track and jump in i might sing the whole thing one time or i might just go in and like set up like for my first verse just set up a loop like that record enable and just uh once it comes up do that um, for the verse a couple times Look into your eyes. Yeah, I'll probably run it through that some of these effects back, just back, back, back. there we go <laughs> Look into your eyes see there's no surprise just I'm just ready to go you know and that's important to be ready for action right away and and like in this song especially like that these verses are really quiet and then the choruses are like at the top of my vocal range so it, it's going to be much better to do them one at a time because probably if i did verse one then chorus then verse two verse two is going to be like way overblown compared to verse one And that's the process I'll do. And I got to say, it has made recording these vocals a lot easier. Like the first song I did took the most time getting it in there, but um, the other ones came across, came out like a lot quicker because I didn't have that beginning part. So the time for me, like opening the session and singing and like feeling it is so much shorter. And this, yeah, this is, yeah, so they're, uh, 
that's the BF channel strip. It's one of the last free packs I put out. I use that for everything. It just, it literally just shows up when I create a new track. So if I did command T it's, it's my default track. You can make anything. You can put it on your track. You just right click there on the title of the track default audio track, and it'll save that in your user library under defaults, creating tracks, audio track and this, it'll be right there. But that's, you know, that's another time saver too. Just one less thing to like pull you out of the mood. If I feel like, oh, I really need a low, low cut here. I can just turn that up and I'm, I'm done. I'm not going in the browser. I'm not finding EQ8. I'm not activating it and switching it to, you know, low pass or high pass or whatever I need. It's just a knob. Just turn the knob. It's especially nice now with uh, Live 11, how you can set exactly how many macros you want. Yeah. Yeah, probably uh, if I did this and I'd made this a while back, maybe, I don't know how far back, but a while back, probably now I might have more macros or I don't know, maybe I would have done fewer macros. You could start making macro variations too, like for a specific type of vocal. You could have different macro variations that like oh, already yeah. have the filters set and whatever. Yeah, that's a great idea, right? Like just this will be a low cut, which I do on like everything. So I could have that. Yeah, I should probably do that. Just hit the button, low cut. Hmm. You're welcome, Brandon. Well, I don't know. Anything else before we part ways here? I got to recommend wireless headphones. I recently got a pair of uh, Sennheiser wireless headphones at the thrift shop. And then yeah. I got the transceiver for them. They use uh, radio frequency. Mm -hmm. So like even during this, I could like wander around the house when I needed to and still keep listening to you. And nice. so for recording guitar and vocals, they are amazing. Hmm. Yeah, I have a, I think I have Sennheiser actually too, wireless ones um, that I just uncovered. I kind of forgot I had them. So maybe I'll have to try them again. But yeah, I think you're right. I think they are, they're not Bluetooth. Because um, I think I got them like before things were going Bluetooth, like for you know, headphones at least, I think, I don't know. I have to pull those These out. ones have a really long range. I can go outside for quite a ways. Really? Oh yeah, I I have a whole bunch of boxes like I gotta go through. I think they're in one of them somewhere. I'll check that out. Hmm. Yeah, I'm always like I I don't have it on right now, but uh, for these headphones, I have like an extension cable, which is super helpful too. Um, where it may, it's like twenty extra feet. It's it's basically just uh, got a an, an quarter inch that you can input in and then it just goes out to the regular quarter inch headphone jack. But being able to like walk around and move and do things is really helpful. Yeah, I'm always like twisting my cord around my leg or around the chair or whatever. Yeah. I, I, got, I got to remember to try those wireless ones because uh, even still like you, the long wire, you just, next thing you know, your guitar cable is like braided into the... <laughs> Uh, and then you put on your guitar strap you're like okay wait does the speaker thing go here where does the headphone thing go like it gets very confusing yeah i always like to put my guitar on first then the headphones for because usually the wire gets under the strap <laughs> so dude yeah. figuring out the guitar headphone guitar strap thing i mean isn't that part isn't that like our that's kind of what i do you know i wouldn't know what to do if it was easy <laughs> i know i know it's i I always mess it up at some point. <laughs> I might have to look into that, Adamus. That is, that's, a, that's, that's innovation, man. The only problem now is I've had my wired headphones in a couple times and forgot that they're not the wireless ones and walk too far with them. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that's funny. That's not funny, but it's funny. <laughs> well, I haven't damaged anything, so it's funny now. Right. <laughs> that's cool. Good tip. Well, 
Well, maybe we'll call it a day then. We'll wrap it up. Um, I'll be. I'm hoping to finish the vocals like in a in the next week or two. Uh, and on to the next thing, and I'll whatever that is, we'll make a live class out of it. And if you guys have any thoughts or suggestions, like you know, in the Discord, we can put that in there and see if that I can help with that. Um, yeah, but this this is fun. It's fun. Uh, like, it, I gotta say, like, just for me, even like going over the process and like kind of remembering why I'm doing things is really helpful too. It just like solidifies it. Um, you know, the, I, this is why like it's good to write things down and take notes. But this is like verbal note taking, so it's it's helpful. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many little tricks that we learn sometimes we, we forget them again and then later you're like oh yeah i could have done that cool little trick right yeah like sometimes you look at things like why did i do it that way then you realize you're like oh because it saves me a ton of time <laughs> i think you said somewhere in the chat brian that the best way to learn something is by teaching it as well or at least vocalizing it yes uh, i i stand by those words uh i learned that like teaching high school and I had to like learn grammar <laughs> so I could teach it. <laughs> like stuff like that, like you, you know, we all sort of just by speaking the language, you have like just this sort of like innate understanding of it. But when you have to verbalize it, it really does help. And, uh, and I get a lot of that out of the podcast too, sometimes on uh, episodes without a guest where I'm trying to capture ideas like just talking through it it's so helpful i guess that's why talk therapy works because you're just talking through things and putting it into like uh concrete words instead of this like cloud of ideas that's circling around in your head yeah yeah it might have come up in the discord yeah i think in our minds we skip things when they get too difficult to explain yeah. yeah yeah i think so too and sometimes you realize it's not as difficult as you thought if you can just put it down into words i mean similar things actually happen with with the recording of the music um because these are songs like we play a lot we jam on them you know like once a week we record it we listen to it but every time we play each person has like sort of like this like cloud of possibilities of what they might do like the kick drums say for instance like where are the kick hits exactly um sometimes they're here sometimes they're here sometimes they're here um once it got recorded it was like here are the kick hits so now when we went to do the bass it was like well you have to do something that fits with that so out of your cloud of bass parts <laughs> which one are you going to put down here and then that informed the guitar parts and it same thing happens with the singing it's just interesting how these songs were like um these like blurry ideas and then as soon as you record them like everything comes into focus a lot better and then when you play after listening to it like now we we're, we like sound better live without having actually played because we've all like kind of narrowed in on what we're actually doing so it's a big help well i guess we'll pack it in then um thank you all so much for coming this was a lot of fun i, I hope it was helpful and useful and maybe inspiring on some level and i look forward to doing it again soon thanks very much brian thank you glad you could make it bye uh, thanks brian you guys all take care. I'll see you soon.